Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. As a country, we are armed to the teeth. We lead the world in numbers of civilian guns owned, with 90 guns per 100 residents. Last year, 14,232 Americans were killed by gun violence, and 648 of these were children under 11. 1,500 of these deaths were unintentional. They occurred as the result of an accident. Mass shootings particularly shock the conscience. There have been 90 mass shootings in America since 1982. Although mass shootings represent a small percentage of gun deaths overall, in the past five years there have been 10 mass shootings in America, resulting in 214 deaths, not including the 2012 atrocity at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut, where 27 people, including 20 children, ages 6 and 7, were murdered. The Pittsburgh synagogue shootings in October 2018, where 11 were killed. The Virginia Beach shootings last May, where 13 lost their lives. Or the August 2019 Dayton, Ohio massacre, which claimed 10 lives. As Congress dithers, we wonder whether we can do anything to reduce the level of gun violence and save lives. With us is Mike Weiser. Mike Weiser is a gun shop owner and a Ph.D. who has authored six books about guns. He's a card-carrying member of the NRA, which he says has been hijacked by the gun nuts. If anyone has the solution, it's Mike Weiser, and I'm pleased to welcome him to this table. My pleasure. Now, Mike, uh, you own a gun shop. I do. How long have you owned it? I've owned this shop since 2000. And it's in Springfield, Massachusetts? It's outside of Springfield. It's in a little town called Ware, which is W-A-R-E. And um, I notice you're wearing an NRA badge. What is that all about? Well, I'm a certified law enforcement trainer. And uh, that's a different certification from most of the trainers who do civilian safety training. But uh, in my case, I have this shirt uh, because uh, I do what we call lethal force certifications with uh, armed security, both private and public. Uh, now, you're an NRA member. I'm a, not only an NRA member, I've been a member since uh, 1955, and uh, I'm actually a, uh, what they call a, a uh, benefactor member. I give them enough money that no matter what I say, they can't throw me out. Now, the NRA takes the position that we shouldn't be trying to regulate objects like guns. We should be trying to regulate people. Do you, do you agree with that? Well, actually, I don't agree with it at all, but that's, in fact, what they're saying happens to be a very accurate statement of our regulatory system. Uh, we are the only country which gives uh, its citizens, and actually non-citizens, free access to an extremely lethal product. We regulate the behavior of people who we feel shouldn't be able to get their hands on this product, we do no regulation of the product itself. I don't know any industry that wants to be regulated. <laughs> when people tell me, well, the NRA is opposed to regulation, my first response is, and so the banks aren't? Everybody's opposed to regulation. But if we're talking about a consumer industry, we have to look at it from end to end, from when the product is made until it's bought and used. And as I say, we regulate all kinds of consumer products. You know, you can't buy a, a crib for your baby if the slats are too wide and the baby's head can go through. We regulate all kinds of designs in terms of automobiles for safety reasons. We do not do any regulation uh, on this particular product. Well, there's some regulation since uh, certainly, for example, the Tommy gun, Al Capone. You right. Back gun. in 1934, we decided that there were certain kinds of products that were so lethal, that were so destructive, that uh, they couldn't uh, be sold to the average person unless that individual was willing to go through a more uh, extremely difficult vetting system and so forth. As a matter of fact, there are some 60,000 fully automatic weapons in the hands of uh, Mr. and Mrs. America or Mr. and Ms. America. But the last time there was an intentional shooting with a fully automatic weapon, I think it was 1947, precisely because the vetting process and the licensing process is so secure. So 
to buy a, uh, a Tommy gun manufactured after 1986, that's banned, isn't Correct. it? Correct. Right? Correct. And before 1986, there is an intensive it's regime not only, of regulation. Well, it's intensive, and it's, it's, it's expensive. How, and much, how much is a Tommy gun? Tommy gun now, because of the, there's so few of them around, kind of floating around, anywhere is from $1,500 up. Now, that might sound like a lot of money, but I know people who pay almost that much for a good skateboard. Well, people have told me maybe as much as $50,000. Depends on the type of gun. It depends on whether or not it's a collector's item. There's all kinds of factors. Yes, there are a few that would be uh, expensive. But the real issue is that it takes anywhere up to six months to get the licensing done. First of all, you have to live in a state which allows you to own a, uh, a fully automatic weapon. And if uh, you live in such a state, you usually have to get a different kind of state license than what you would get for an ordinary firearm. And then you have to go through a two-step process at the federal level. Um, so it takes, it takes a good deal of time. There's a, a $200 tax stamp that you have to buy on top of it. The Treasury gets a little piece of the action. Um, and, and if I want to take a, my Tommy gun from uh, New York to Massachusetts, I have to check in with the uh, alcohol, tobacco, and fire. Not, not if you're just driving through the state and it's locked up in the back of your car. Oh, no. but if it's not? No. You don't have to? No. Okay. No. So now what is the difference in terms of lethality between a, a Tommy gun, a Tomlinson semi-automatic machine gun, and uh, an AR-15? Well, you just made a slight mistake when you said the, Tom, the Thompson semi-automatic gun. It's not. The AR-15 that is currently sold to civilians okay, has a locking sear. It requires that every time you shoot the gun, you have to pull the trigger. And this has often been cited, and it continues to be cited by the gun industry, as proof of the fact that this is not a military gun, this is not a full auto gun, this is not as lethal, blah, 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 blah. In fact, the young man who walked into, or actually crashed himself, into Sandy Hook Elementary School discharged roughly 95 rounds in less than a minute and a half. His entire rampage was five minutes, but most of that time was spent going from one room to another. So the idea that you can shoot semi-automatic ammunition at that rate of fire and this is, by the way, military ammo. This is military ammo that is designed for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to injure or kill somebody that you're pointing the gun at. The idea that you could discharge 90 rounds of this ammo in a minute or a minute and a half, and this isn't lethal? I mean, <laughs> no, 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 that, that doesn't work. So you use an AR-15, the shooter used an AR-15. Correct. And, uh, did it that require multiple actions of the trigger, or was it? It, it required to pull multiple it actions, but how quickly can you move your finger like this? Almost as fast as in an exactly. automatic. Exactly, and the way the gun is designed, since the magazines load from beneath rather than on top of the gun, the magazine can be very long. It can hold a lot of ammunition, and the way that again, the way the gun is designed in terms of releasing an empty magazine and putting a new one in that's loaded. What he did, and which is not unusual, is he taped two magazines together facing in opposite directions, and he could very quickly release that entire thing, flip it around, and put the new magazine back in. So maybe it took him to reload another 30 rounds, because he was using 30 round mags, maybe it took him a second, a second and a half. Did you sell AR-15s in your gun shop? Yes. And if I went to your gun shop, I could buy one? Well, you, uh, as a New York resident, no, actually, probably not, because uh, New York's under the safe law. I think they've made the type of AR that you can buy. Uh, it's not really an assault rifle anymore in terms of how we usually define that. And by the way, it happens to be true in Massachusetts. I can sell you a used assault rifle that I have in the shop that I've had, but the Mass Massachusetts passed a new assault rifle regulation, which basically stops the sale of new assault rifles like the AR-15. So, um, is But you could go to uh, New Jersey. i go to New Jersey. Sure. And I wouldn't require a background check? No. What happens, well, again, I'm not sure. Of, let's see. Let's see if, if there's a state that New York, no. See, the problem is that New York is surrounded by very regulated states. <laughs> 
But normally what happens is that if you are buying any long gun, any rifle, that's defined as any weapon with a barrel of 16 inches or longer. So that's a hunting rifle. Well, that's any rifle. You can go to a contiguous state Go to a gun shop there, show your driver's license to that show that you live in a state which has a border that, you know, shows so that I know state. how to drive. Right. Exactly. You pass the background check there, and then you bring the gun back. And if, when you bring the gun back, if your own state requires additional licensing, that's for you to do. But for example, the kid who brought an assault rifle, I f I don't, I'm not sure which model he used, into the uh, garlic festival in California. He bought the gun legally across the border in Nevada, passed a background check in Nevada, and brought the gun back to California because it was a long gun, it was a rifle. So does a, a long gun, a rifle, can be used for hunting, but does an AR-15 have any purpose other than to kill people? Um, well, actually... In a funny way, it does. And by a funny What's way, the funny way? The funny way is that, believe it or not, uh, what the AR allows you to do is replicate in real time and with a real gun what kids used to do at the shooting range or what kids can do on video. The real reason that that gun is popular is because you see a kid in front of a video machine or an adult. He's going bang, 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 bang. You know, the video, <laughs> you know, using a laser. Okay, I remember as a kid, I used to go to Coney Island, and for a quarter, you got a, a 22 rifle with 10, 10 shots, and you shot at these little plastic ducks going by. It was a lot of fun. Well, you can kind of do that with an AR because you can shoot 30, 40 rounds very quickly. And if you're in a protected space, you know, a range or this kind of thing, and you set up three or four bottles with soda in them or whatever, it's fun. Now, you might say, well, how can shooting a gun be fun? Well, <laughs> it may not be fun to a lot of people, but there's an awful lot of people out there who own expensive uh, television video games that are shooting games. So if we have 40 million homes with expensive, you know, multi-hundreds of dollars video shooting games, why would you think that it wouldn't be just as interesting to replicate that in real time with a real gun, of course it would. But I can't kill people with a shooting game, with a video shooting game. The people who buy these guns are overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly people who will never, ever use that gun in an illegal or an improper way. Let, let me make one point to respond to something that you said at, at your intro, which was very well done in terms of you know capturing the problem. You said that we have a per capita ownership rate of almost one to one. In other words, we have 320 million people. Uh, the estimates are that we have 270 to 350 million guns floating around. Okay, that's fine. That statement, unfortunately, totally distorts the issue. And it's used, by the way, by both sides. The gun people use it to say, you see, we got so many guns, it's a normal thing to have. The gun control people say, well, that's the problem. We got so many guns, that's the reason we have so much you know, gun violence. In point of fact, of those 300 million guns, let's take the round number, probably only about 60 million of them. Now, 60 is a large number, but probably only about 60 million of them are the types of guns that ever feature in gun violence at all. Look, Sometimes, you know, I live in a town which typical of smaller towns, the, the, the population's graying, people getting older, the kids leave to get a job, go to school, don't come back. They come back when, um, when uh, dad's passed away, mom's put into the nursing home, they have to clean out the house. And what do they find down in the basement? A bunch of rusted old shotguns that dad used to, dad probably got from his grandfather. Okay, Because where I live is outside of Springfield, it's a fairly, it's still a hunting rural area. Western Mass is not like Boston Metro, okay? So they bring the guns over to the gun shop. What do we do with these? I give them 10 bucks a piece. They're broken, they're junk. They're old single shot shotguns, okay? I put them out on the rack and I charge $20 a piece for them. Every one of those guns will sell to some guy who says, ah, that's the gun I need because it has a part in it that I need to fix my old gun, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Now, 
that guy, when he comes into my shop, he has to jump through the same legal hoops to get this broken, rusted old shotgun that somebody else has to jump through who comes in and buys a Glock concealable pistol that holds 17 rounds of high-powered military ammo. But it isn't much of a legal hoop. He shows his driver's license that he comes from uh, But we actually believe, because of this notion of the 300 million guns, that we're making a difference in terms of gun violence by having that guy jump through this hoop for this old gun. And meanwhile, all we hear from the ATF is, oh, we don't have enough people, we can't do this, we can't do that. Well, if they weren't spending their time regulating 200 and 240 million guns that never figure in gun violence at all, maybe they'd have some time to do what they're supposed to do. Well, but uh, let's just uh, go back to the AR-15. Okay. Remember in the debate stage, Beto O'Rourke had something to say mm -hmm. about the AR-15. He sure did. <laughs> and let's Great. go to the videotape and we'll hear what he had to say. El Paso is your hometown. Some on this stage have suggested a voluntary buyback for guns in this country. You've gone further. You said, quote, Americans who own AR-15s and AK-47s will have to sell them to the government, all of them. You know the critics call this confiscation. Are you proposing taking away their guns, and how would this work? I am. If it's a weapon that was designed to kill people on a battlefield, if the high-impact, high-velocity round, when it hits your body, shreds everything inside of your body because it was designed to do that so that you would bleed to death on a battlefield and not be able to get up and kill one of our soldiers. When we see that being used against children, and in Odessa, I met the mother of a 15-year-old girl who was shot by an AR-15, mm -hmm. and that mother watched her bleed to death over the course of an hour because so many other people were shot by that AR-15 in Odessa and Midland. There weren't enough ambulances to get to them in time. Hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15, your AK-47. <laughs> we're not going to allow it to be used against our fellow Americans anymore. Congressman, thank you. And I want to say this. I'm listening to the people of this country. The day after I proposed doing that, I went to a gun show in Conway, Arkansas, to meet with those who are selling AR-15s and AK-47s and those who are buying those weapons. And you might be surprised there was some common ground there. Folks who said, I would willingly give that up, cut it to pieces. I don't need this weapon to hunt, to defend myself. It is a weapon of war. So let's do the right thing, but let's bring everyone in America into the conversation, Republicans, Democrats, gun owners, and non-gun owners alike. So is the AR-15 and the AK-47, are those weapons of war? Oh, absolutely. And did they have a purpose other than to kill people? Nope. Except to fool around on the range. Except to fool around on the range. Right. So is he right? Should the government confiscate these weapons? Well, if the government decides to buy them back, okay, then technically it's not confiscation. I mean, it is in the sense you're saying you can't own it anymore. But confiscation usually means that whether you want it to give it back or not, you lose it. Uh, that's it's like condemning your house for a railroad. Right, that, but that's a violation of, you know, do, it's a violation of well, not if Well, not if they pay you. Right, no, exactly. The point yeah. is they would, have to, yeah. they would have to pay you. But the point is this. If anything, uh, when he made that statement, this was right when a whole spate of these real kind of rampage shootings were going on. You know, you mentioned mass shootings. Mass shootings are usually defined as three or four people killed in the same place at the same time, in a public place. But we're talking here, in this uh, book by Louis Cl Clarivas, we're talking about rampage shootings. Multiple, you know, 10, 12, 20, 30 people. And when Beto made that statement, this was right in the midst of a whole bunch of these shootings. Okay? The problem with it is that in the overall scheme of things, these types of events, even the, recently when there were so many of them, these types of events are not really what creates the 14,000, well, it's actually 35 because there are also 21,000 suicides. It's not what creates the 14,000, uh, you know, intentional fatal injuries, one person against another. Okay? That's created by the day-to-day -day stuff that's going on 
in every high crime, every high violence community in this country. And if anything, uh, Cory Booker's uh, idea of national gun registration was much more radical than what Beto said, because if we had national gun registration, then we wouldn't only be looking at who owns the ARs, we would be looking at who owns all of the guns that really cause gun violence. So right now, uh, the legislation or the regulation we have in place is the Brady Bill, isn't that Correct. right? Correct. Correct. And that provides for a three-day waiting period. Only if you don't pass the check immediately. If you don't pass the check if immediately. If there is something in the database which makes them think they need to look further, okay, the uh, that, then they hold for three days. The and problem, after three days, if they don't come up with an objection, right. You, you get, get the gun. Well, here's the problem. The problem is that in most cases, in order to follow up on what they see as a problem in the initial check, they have to go to the state where they think the problem is. And in many cases, those state databases are not that well developed. So the reason that there's a long pause that often it goes well past three days and they don't get any answer. I mean, that, you know, it's not that the answer then comes back later on, oh, the guy shouldn't have had the gun. No. What happens is that um, they can't get the answer at the state level because the state databases aren't, aren't developed in, in such a robust way. Okay. So if they can't get the answer in three days, the legislation provides that the applicant gets the gun. I don't know of a single study. I may be wrong on this, but I don't know of a single study which has ever been able to link up the three-day delay people with subsequent violent use or well, illegal we, use of We guns. had one instance. Oh, no, I'm not I, saying it doesn't happen. Yeah. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. But, I, but the idea that there's you know, millions of people running around who shouldn't have guns because you know, they don't get that final answer in three days. I, by the way, have always thought that three days was silly, that this was nothing. This was simply thought up off the top of everybody's heads. Okay, three days. Knowing, as I do, what the database situation is like, even in a state like Massachusetts, which is more progressive and more developed than most in terms of online data, you can't say, you can't call a lot of these states up and say, you know, we need an answer in three days. You're not going to get an answer. I okay, so there's right. now a legislation passed by the House of Representatives right. that will expand the three days to 10 days. I think that's absolutely proper. You think that's proper? Oh, absolutely. But the Senate hasn't acted on it. Why should they act on now, it? Now, what, what, well, let's, <laughs> they're not Democrats. Well, <laughs> That really shouldn't be the answer. The overwhelming majority of, of the American people favor gun regulation, favor background checks, and favor, Jim, favor Jim. banning uh, AK-37s and AR-15s. Jim, so I, why hasn't the Congress responded? I'll tell you why. Because I hate to break it to you, but all of these surveys have been done by Gallup, by Pew, by my friends in the public health school, uh, the Bloomberg School and Hopkins, which ask gun owners whether they are in favor of what they love to call reasonable gun restraints, such as background checks, stuff like that, they'll always get an overwhelming positive response. There's only one problem with that. There has yet to be a single survey which asks gun owners to define what they consider to be a reasonable restriction. If you ask the average gun owner, what he thinks would be the best way to get rid of gun violence, to reduce gun violence, you know what he'll tell you? He'll tell you, abolish gun-free zones. Have you ever seen that question on any of these surveys? No. What's a gun-free zone? Means that you can't go someplace with your gun. Ah. Okay? And this and Shouldn't is, the whole nation be a gun-free zone? Well, absolutely, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to weapons of war like the AR, of course. Yeah. But what we have now is a situation in which you, if you are legally allowed to have a gun, you can take it just about anywhere. Can't take it into a school, can't take it into a military reservation, can't take it, you know, a few other places. But, you know, you walk into a shopping center, yeah, if you look at the fine print, you might see no weapons here, but nobody checks. You can walk into a movie theater. You can walk in with your gun in many states. You can walk into a church or a place of worship in most states with your gun. 
Okay, so Mike, I have a question for you. Sure. The question is, what's the answer? Ah, what's the answer? It's very simple. I think we need to look directly at the industry itself. We need to define lethality in terms of the design, the caliber, the action of every gun. And then we need to say, okay, here's, you know, add up the points. And if the gun scores too many points on the lethality scale, you want to own one, fine, but then you have to go through the kind of registration and, you know, and background check that we have now for the machine guns for the NFA. So the answer is a lethality scale. The answer is making the industry judge the level of dangerousness of its products. The level of dangerousness of its products. Correct. Mike Weiser, thank you so much for coming by. This has been wonderful. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. Please check out my book, Plaintiff in Chief, which is now available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and your favorite independent bookstore. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best. Thank you.